Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Managing Madrid podcast. I'm your host, Keon Sabani, joined by Sam Leverage, who is at the Bernabeu right now, press row, to talk about Luka Modric coming off, coming in off the bench to rip Sevilla's heart out in the most spectacular, classic Luka Modric vintage Modric goal. It was the classic Modric finish. The cut to the right, right on the inside of the near post. Beautiful. Shades of Manchester United 2013, whenever that was. I think it was 2013. What a beautiful sight. Modric game winner off the bench. Sam Leverage was there to take it all in, including the Ramos return. Sam, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Hey, Ken. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Getting cold at the, at the roundabout. But yeah, I apologize for any background noise there. I'm wearing the lawn on the pitch. So straight into preparations for the next one. But yeah, uh, an entertaining evening. More, more entertaining than perhaps 1-0 makes it sound. So Sam will probably have to go pretty soon because he is... Uh, going to have to attend the Carlo Ancelotti press conference, press conference, which uh, usually is he's the second coach. So first, Kike Sanchez Flores will come out. He'll speak, and then Ancelotti will come out after. So I'm going to try to focus on getting as much out of Sam as possible, who was there on a special night. Why don't we start from the top? Ramos reception. A lot of people were kind of bummed out that there wasn't really a Ramos tribute. You heard some fans booing. What was it like actually like in the stadium? It was very weird. It was before the match, pre kickoff, and everything. I mean, he was he came out to to warm up, and he was applauded then by the fans that were in the stadium. Then the teams were read out, and he got standing ovation from pretty much all of the Bernabeu. But then when the game actually kicked off, it was like he was any other opposition player. There were even some whistles and boos for him, and I think that almost kind of reflects the the Madrid-based fans that we sometimes forget about a little bit because they're kind of more the, the minority we don't hear about so much online on social media. A lot of Real Madrid fans were quite hurt by how he left and felt that he was trying to squeeze more money along the contract out of the club. And there are still some people who don't look back on Sergio Ramos necessarily as favourably as most Real Madrid fans do. And so I think we had a little bit of that tonight with the whistles and the boos, but, but generally I think most people at the Benabel were very happy to see Sergio Ramos come back. And, and it was very Sergio Ramos in the referee's ear the whole way through the game, uh, even taking on Luka Modric and, and Nacho and some of his old teammates. So... Yeah, it was it was strange to see him back at the Bernabeu, but in different colours. It was a, a weird occasion. Uh, as always, like when you're there, sometimes the minority are very loud, so they can overtake the majority at times, and and it's not really a reflection of how the entire fan base feels. I know even at managing Madrid, there are conflicting opinions on Sergio Ramos and 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 the way he left, and and I always look at him as this club legend, and I can't really get mad at some of the stuff he was doing today because that's what made Ramos so special with us. Uh, exactly, does... yeah. No, I think Real Madrid fans kind of respected that as well. That The first one or two times he was arguing with the referee, there was kind of, hey, leave him alone. And then it was, wait, <laughs> this is what Sergio Ramos has always done. This is Sergio Ramos. Not backing down from anyone. I actually thought he had a pretty good game uh, for all the bodies that Sevilla plugged into the box and tried to limit the amount of clear-cut chances we got. I thought he was fantastic. Had some key interventions, big blocks, and in iconic Sergio Ramos fashion, when Rodrigo goes down in uh, the first half, Ramos just looks at him and goes, get up, get up. It is the iconic Sergio Ramos get up. All right, Ramos tribute out of the way. We love you, but uh, we got our own team to focus on. What did you think of how this game unfolded? Um, Nil-nil at halftime. We left it late to score the game winner. Sevilla frustrated us. What was something that caught your eye in terms of what they did to make it difficult for us? Well, I think it was almost what we spoke about yesterday in the pre-match podcast where we were talking about what it might be like. They kind of really congested the middle and I think we saw a lot of that. Vinicius was as wide as I've seen him any time this season. He was almost on the left touchline for pretty much all of the game. Uh, and that central area was very congested and that was where I think we really missed Jude Bellingham in particular, because there were a lot of times where Brahim down the right or Vinny down the left would find that space that they'd beat a player out wide and then they'd be looking to pick up the ball back across in the middle and they'd just find Rodrigo on his own up against, you know, Sergio Ramos and, and all these big, tall, physical defenders. And you just kind of needed that run from deep that wasn't there because it was Brahim that was on the right, Rodrigo kind of on the last shoulder and Vinny on the left. So 
they just wasn't that kind of figure arriving into the box that could have been Jude Bellingham on another day. And then, I mean, it was strange because at the same time, Brahim and Vinny were having quite a big impact, but just in the middle, there was nothing. And, and perhaps Rossellu, if he was available for this game, would have made a bit of a difference. But it was really one of those games where we've seen it before with Rodrigo that he just doesn't fit when you're playing against a team who is sitting very deep and he doesn't have that physicality. And at the same time, he didn't quite in that central role. He's still lacking that ability to create something out of nothing. And I think also with his confidence, how it is at the moment, not having scored for a while, he's kind of not at the top of his game. And and it was one of those where I think we were just waiting too long for that moment of magic. And then Luka Madrid's produced it. I think that analysis is bang on, Sam. I, I think everyone was uh, trying to do the right things. I'll put it that way. Like I, I, saw, I, th- I thought that some of the criticism of Real Madrid at halftime was pretty harsh in my opinion because I think people underestimate how difficult it can be to break down compact blocks like that where you have three central defenders, a ton of width, a ton of coverage, and a team that really all they care about is just plugging holes centrally and bursting out on the counter and not really, like, you know, you, me, you and Mehedi were talking before the game and talking about what Sevilla is good at and, and the fact that they actually have the third most touches in the final third of any team in La Liga behind Real Madrid and Barcelona. But they just didn't play that way tonight. They came with a mission, and and you called it too with Kike Sanchez Flores and, and the way he might approach this game. And I I think you were bang on on that. Sevilla made it difficult, and I think when you look at what Real Madrid were trying to do, I think they were doing the right things. I thought Vinicius and Rodrigo, or uh, Vinicius and Brahim, left wing, right wing, they were doing the right things to break lines. Sevilla had difficulty containing those two players on the wings. They were able to get past one or two and get a good ball into the box. Our problem was, like you said, we didn't really have the central presence. Sevilla, with that many defenders in the box, they didn't have many people to mark. A couple times we did break through, break through was the Vasquez goal, which was disallowed. That was a great offensive sequence. Another one where Vinicius gets the ball to Vasquez on the, uh, in the box again, but there was a foul, so the referee stopped play. Uh, and I also think the way we had the fullbacks position, so Mendy on the left, Vasquez on the right, you look at their heat maps, they were playing very high in this game. They were playing high up the pitch. And so in terms of doing the right things to create space for the wingers and create chances, I think we were doing the right things. Part of the problem was we weren't really sending players into the box. You saw Chu Mendy go in a couple times. I can kind of understand why Carlo didn't want to flood the opposition's box because that leaves you vulnerable in transition. Uh, and we did see a little bit, like, to start the second half right immediately, we started to send all of our midfielders into the box. Valverde hits the post, and then it was kind of largely uneventful. I think the referee getting subbed out of the game, subbing himself out of the game, took some of the, the wind out of the sails a little bit, and then Mordor saved the day. Like, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with the W, and and, and it wasn't, I think, as bad as maybe um, some of the analysts on on my, my TV feed made it out to be anyway. Yeah, and I think Sevilla as well. I think perhaps now we forget quite the quality of the chances that they had. I think their XG was more or less the same as Real Madrid's, despite the fact they only had like two, three shots. And that was because they had that really good early chance when Enlizadi kind of skied it. And then they had that chance from Isaac Romero, who forced a really good save from Andrew Lunin, the only time he had to do anything in the whole game. Great save. But it was a fantastic save. He doesn't save that. Sevilla had gone one nil up and they were defending very well. How many times have we seen this kind of game where a team comes to, to take a nil-nil draw? They have that one chance on the counter. And like you say, I mean, with Chalmini, if he was pushing forward a little bit more, there might have been one or two more of those counter-attacks that, that might have ended in the goal instead. So credit to Sevilla because I think they handled it really well. But at the end of the day, it was just the quality. And, and perhaps there's another thing to talk about with the bench that Real Madrid had tonight. And Ancelotti didn't make a sub until the 74th minute. And Modric was pretty much the only player on the bench who could improve what was on the pitch and and that's eventually the the small difference that he made was was enough to get the win but there really weren't many options for Carlo Ancelotti to turn to uh yeah and uh I'm just gonna Sam can you see my screen being shared right now yep yeah so we'll just this is something I just like to do for the people who are tuning in on YouTube we can kind of go over it together so Real Madrid XG of 1.02 basically one Sevilla 0.97 um these are Sevilla's two big chances Isaac Romero, 
and and Nesiri. Then Nesiri one, I want I remember this one. This was he runs past Mendy. And I think Mendy should have kept tracking him. He stopped tracking him, left him up, left it up to Nacho, and Nacho just couldn't close it in time. And Nasiri misses it. This one, 51st minute Romero. This was a huge Lunin save, I think, right? That was the one. Must have been. And uh, on the flip side, Fede Valverde, this is the chance that hits the post 48th minute. So we have a, a high volume of kind of low quality chances, if you will. And this is the mortgage goal at 0.05. So this is just a, that was just a quick rundown of the chances. What did you think of the mortar sub? I know it obviously worked out, and uh, and Ancelotti is way smarter than us. But uh, I kind of was skeptical about. It. I was like, okay, so too many. I assume was going to start getting into the opposition's box more. But then with the mortar sub, we sent them back to, to defense. And uh, I was just kind of skeptical of how that will work from an aerial presence and and. And and that stuff. So, what what did you think of the sub? Yeah, it was a bit of a gamble, but I kind of saw the sense in it. I think something had to change because what Real Madrid were doing, they kind of had that ten fifteen minute period a bit before the referee decided to sub himself off. And that ten to fifteen minute period, if the goal didn't come then, then it slowed down, and you're thinking something has to change. Otherwise, there's not going to be a breakthrough. And so you look at the Real Madrid bench, and I mean, the only forward on the bench was Alvaro, who, who in the end had quite a interesting impact in the injury time when he came on. But you have Alvaro, who's not a game changer in that sense, and obviously Castilla player. Then the midfielders, you've got Modric, Dani Tebayos, and Ardu Goulet. I mean, if you're going to call on one of those players to come in and change your game, it has to be Modric. And I think having Tony Cruz in that, then the holding role, but a lot more advanced than Charmini had been, I think it kind of made sense. And, and it was interesting. And also the point that eventually led to the goal was that Modric is a player who can take shots from distance, and we saw a little bit of that from Fede del Verde. Um, but Modric was a little bit more of a player who's not going to smash the ball as hard as he can like Fede del Verde will, but he'll try and place it. And it was very clear that if you're going to have nine, ten men in the box for most of this game, then we need to have somebody who can take shots from distance, who can take advantage of those free kicks and things around the box. And, and that was what Modric did in the end that, that made the difference. Uh, I know you gotta you gotta go in a second to Ancelotti's press conference. Uh, so I want to just get your parting thoughts on this game before I kind of I guess just go over my own notes and interact with the fans a little bit. But what did you want to? Um, it can be anything from the game, first half, second half, experience of the stadium, etc. What What did you want to talk about? Yeah, I think one of the big points was, was Lucas Vasquez's goal in what, the seventh, eighth minute. I mean, if that had gone in, if that had been allowed, it would have been an entirely different game. And I can imagine this could have been 4-5-0 or five nil if Sevilla had had to chase the game and, and struggle to do that. So I think that was a big turning point. And then I think it was interesting, the use of the bench from Carlo Ancelotti, uh, Arda Goulet's birthday, and he didn't get a minute. Perhaps that was a little bit harsh, but given the circumstances, I think you could see why. I, yeah, the atmosphere was, was very good. I think that people were, were very excited to see Sergio Ramos back. But then as, as soon as the first whistle went, it was, OK, Sergio Ramos is just another opposition player and we're here to cheer on our team. And in the end, I think this is the three points that will make a big difference when we get to the business end of the season, when we've got Champions League, quarterfinals, semifinals. And Ancelotti can afford to rotate a bit more when there are more players available. He'll be looking back thinking, I'm really glad I got this three points against Sevilla, not just one point and a nil no draw. So I think, yeah, that that final push, that, that magic from Luka Modric as well. And who knows, maybe that's the last big Luka Modric moment that we'll get of him at the Bernabeu, which feels like the end is, is coming nearer. And to see the players hoist him up, the fans all applauding him and going crazy for him. I think it's, it's a nice kind of tribute to Luka Modric as we enter this final stretch of, of his career. Yeah. Uh, the scenes, I mean, uh, I'm jealous that you got to witness that. The scenes of all the players hoisting Modric in the air. You could tell, like, it, I and I don't know, you, you you probably wouldn't have seen this part, Sam, because you're so far away. We get we get replays at home. But the, the camera pans on Modric at the end of the game, and he's holding back tears. Like, you could tell how much it meant to him, and everyone's just hugging him. It, it was really a beautiful moment. I, I, I think in a lot of ways it was an ugly game, but it was a beautiful finish. For Maridistas, there's no question. Um, Sam Leverage, your work is invaluable to the website. Thank you for going to almost every single home game for Managing Madrid, doing great work. You're going to post your post-game piece on the website. You're going to post all of Ancelotti's post-game quotes on the website as well. Thank you so much, man. And uh, 
No problem at all. I'll give you a quick tour of the Bernabeu as well. For all right, live look. Beautiful. Well, that's... It it's blurred out. It oh, you the have blurred the blurred background. screen. <laughs> it's, that is uh, not good to show you the view, is it? But we can still see. How about this? All right, here we go. Beautiful. Empty, it, but... It's... Uh, I find when it's empty, it's just spiritual experience. It's very, it's it it's, it's very like just mystical to be there by yourself. Yeah, not many yeah. people get to see the Bernabeu completely empty. So it's, yeah. It's all right, trip, Sam. If it is very cold, fine. I'm gonna go and see what Galito has to say. <laughs> all right, all right, Sam. Great chatting with Thank you. you. All right, take care. Bye. All right, guys. Uh, it's uh, just me and you guys. Right now, so I'm going to go over my notes. Uh, I have a couple of super chats. I'll save those for the end, I guess. I'll, I'll go through them a little bit later. And um, I just did want to go over my notes really quick. And then we can kind of just chat and see what we miss, what I miss, etc. But I think just to go back to the previous analysis, I, I thought Real Madrid basically did what they were supposed to on a tactical level to break Sevilla down. And the one thing they lacked was the aerial presence and, and a Hosulu like presence. And it's something that they had to compensate for at times by, you know, by the 80th minute when you, you start to get a little bit desperate with it, you saw Rudiger actually take up the center forward position. So this is the classic trick that, you know, Zidane used to do with Sergio Ramos. If you need a goal, you need a presence in the box, you just send your best aerial center back in the opposition's box and give yourself a target. Uh, but I think, again, the problem was we didn't have that target. And I thought Vinicius and Brahim had great games in terms of line breaking and, and creation. And they did what they were supposed to do. I was going over some of the numbers after the game. And just like, I'm not supposed to be surprised at this point. Uh, as many of you guys know, I believe that this is possibly the peak of Tony Cruz, which is exactly how he wants to go out. And I asked him before the Leipzig game, like, is this the best football you ever play? Like rank this among your best seasons. And he was like, that's really difficult to do. I don't know. And, and he didn't really say either way, but look at these numbers. These are just wild. 138 touches far and away the most of anyone in the field. You know how, like I always just am I'm amazed by his long ball stats. Usually like 10 for 10, 11 of 11, 16 of 16 today, 18 of 21 long balls completed. Uh, 117 passes, 94% passing accuracy, four key passes. One epic freak out at the referee for trying to get out of the way, getting out of the way and then getting booked for descent. He doesn't freak out much, but when he does, it's truly special. It's a, it's, it's a great freak out face. Um, and it's always justified. Like, remember that time when he got a yellow card for making zero contact with the player who dove? I think that was in the Champions League, you know, a few years ago. He freaked out. His freaks, freaks, freakouts are rare, but they're justifiable and epic. Cruz, brilliant. I thought Vinicius and Brahim were great. Again, I don't know if there's too much else they could have done. They got past their defenders. They put balls into the box. Vinicius probably should have had like two assists in this game. He got unlucky. Didn't even show up as key passes on his stat sheet because the two great chances he did create didn't even count because they were called back for fouls. Um, again, they just missed the presence. And I can kind of understand why Ancelotti didn't want to flood Sevilla's box with Chiumeni and Fede in part because that would have left us vulnerable in transition and they did have their rare counterattack moments and all it takes is one. So I, I kind of get the cautious approach from Carlo in this one. Um, also on Vinicius, a couple things that I wanted to add because I love this performance. The defensive work rate from him has been off the charts this season. Oh, my God. Sid is here. Hold on a sec. I got to add Sid here. Sid. Sid, how long have you been here? No, just a few minutes. I was listening. and Jesus. Um, Sorry, I, man. I didn't even know. I didn't realize you sent me the link. And um, I was just listening to Sam and you talk. So I've been listening to everything. We can just continue from where you're going. You've been here since Sam was here? That's sure. crazy. That was like 15 minutes or 10 minutes I blacked ago. out. My bad. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I didn't know if you were joining or not, but uh, I'm glad to have you. So that's great. You can give me a break from talking. Where did you want? Uh, let me just finish my Vinicius point. Um, defensive work rate from him has been off the charts, and uh, I've just I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the effort. The other thing is he's gotten so good, and this goes back to 
You remember back in the 2022 Champions League run, Sid, that famous image of Benzema drawing lines on his hand and showing Vinicius where to pass the ball. And we always said, like, he's been so good at cutting in and playing the right pass into the box. That pass to Vasquez, and he had two of those today, reminded me of, like, man, this guy, he's so hard to defend because you throw one, two, three defenders at him hoping to close his space and suffocate him and take the space away. But if he just gets that pass early, he he punishes the defense for sending defenders his way. The, the defense just completely collapses because there's an open man in the middle. There obviously is. If you're getting triple teamed, there's an open man somewhere in a good position. So I, I just think he's been really, really good with his decision-making as well. Yeah, I was shocked with that pass. It was a lot similar to the one he played to um, Bellingham in the Classico 2. But this one was more curved. Like, Bellingham's was just kind of through ball. Um, was that the Classico that he did that, or was that Atletico, the, the through ball to Bellingham? The one with the Trevella one, the outside of the boot? Yeah. No, I think it was neither. I thought it was against Rio, wasn't it? Oh, Girona, Girona, Girona. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's done a couple now. Like, he did it in September, too. Who did he do it against in September? I'm pulling that up. Um, oh, that was in Brazil's Friendly against Ghana. He did the same thing. And, yeah, he actually had a crazy one against um, Ghana. Let me open at that one. Oh, never mind. That's, few, that's a wrong clip. But I thought that was great. I thought there were a few moments when he dribbled through the defense and he released the ball well. I actually thought the concern today was the way Sevilla played. We need a little more from Furland. I agreed with that. I saw someone tweet that on Twitter, and I agreed. Like I thought Vinny and Rodrigo did their best, and we're just kind of low on guys who are supposed to play next to them right now, like Bellingham and Hoslu. To be honest, I thought that was a little scary. Maybe Sevilla are better, but I was a li- that game's a little scary when you consider like we played well with the pieces we had, but Lunin had to bail us out, and Vinny had to be amazing to make sure we won, whereas like, and it just kind of shows that our margin for error is down now. Like, we have Hoselu Bellingham. I think we put the game away faster. Um, no doubt about that. I think Vinny probably gets a couple assists today or definitely does more. Agree. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, the other thing, uh, and again, I thought Brahim, especially in the first half, I thought his line breaking on the right side was really good too. Like, out of nothing, he would just get us from point A to point B when it didn't look like it was possible. There was like no no lane to get through and he did it. Um, as always, I think our offensive dynamic completely changes based on where Fede is. If Fede decides to carry the ball and drive the ball forward, if he decides to arrive at the top of the box, it changes our offensive dynamic completely. Um, but he was, he was often a little bit deeper in this game. Uh, and I guess I think we could have used him in an offensive position a little bit more throughout the game. Especially because Brahim didn't play his best game. Like, this is a rare game. I didn't notice him too much at all. Second half, he was more quiet, I thought. First half, he was better. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, it was just tricky. with um, Like, we needed someone between the lines to step up. Modric did that the best. Um, it's just crazy how many players you can throw at the opposition. Like, oh, like, our all-action midfielder isn't stepping up into midfield and getting the goals. And our breakout Spanish 10 slash winger is, is slightly off, then we can bring on 38-year-old Modric. I thought that was funny. Um, I wasn't expecting the goal, though. Like he, I love Modric off the bench, but you, you know a banger like that, you don't expect it. Also, 89th minute, key moment of the game, in my opinion, that may get overlooked. Vasquez tries to dribble past a couple of players on the right wing, loses it. Sevilla all of a sudden break. Modric flying back to defend it and and uh, puts in a huge challenge and Sevilla have a corner kick. It was it was a really important challenge that that I, I wanted to highlight. Like it wasn't just his goal. Like he the guy like came in off the bench and probably heard everything that was said about him. He and, heard Lucas's uh, tweets, huh? Yeah he definitely probably has a couple burner accounts on, on Twitter um tweeting shit at Lucas right now from the locker room. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I I felt I felt I I took a little victory lap on this one because I wrote a huge Modric article uh, a few days ago and uh, I said I think in like the last paragraph like don't put it past this guy to have more epic moments and he came in off the bench and, and did that and it was uh, it was a beautiful scene 
to end the game from him. Yeah, I thought that was really funny that your Modric piece came out this week. Same as like Davies. I finished the piece the hour the news was coming out, and I was just yeah. like, yeah, that works great for us. Um, but yeah, that was. I'm glad you did a Modric profile. I feel like um, there needs to be. I, I mean, I haven't even fully gone through it. I just shared it because I'm like, you know, it's <laughs> propaganda. But um, <laughs> uh, let me pull it up. But um, I think it's. I've always thought that someone needed to do like a Modric like profile. All right, the Immortal of the Mortals. The t- title was great. Um, hmm. I guess this one was shorter, but we need we need a long one too, Kian. We need a long one, like a like Luca Modric, the goat CM, like a deep dive where we go over his whole career one day, one day. I think that 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 piece definitely has to come. I did one a few years ago where I spoke about like kind of his rise from the beginning, his childhood, plus the war in Zagreb and and grenades coming down on the training pitch as they were kids, just crazy stuff this guy's been through. And I think it kind of explains how he's like just so cold blooded in hostile environments like yeah well this guy was literally raised as a kid with in a war like he's playing football and like grenades come down the coaches like go hide under the in the dugout like it's really crazy stuff i'm going to put in the chat two pieces so the first one everyone should go read this both these pieces so um sid and mehedi they wrote a huge analysis on alfonso davies called alfonso davies left back galactico And it does a deep dive, a lot of visuals, data, over 2,000 words of analysis and and, uh, kind of comparing him to Marcelo as well, which was interesting. Just like where where he stacks up against Marcelo, rather, as as an offensive. It would have been a great day for Davies, I thought. We could have used someone like him just to attack the opposition. Um, Yeah, no, he's compared to Marcelo. And just a brief note, I think what Marcelo is – um to Davies is the same as what Neymar is to Vinicius so you have like Neymar's got more flair Marcelo more flair I think Davies and Vinicius are more industrious they run more off the ball um they play at higher speeds maybe like not every touch is like watching a magician with the wand like less of that Modric Marcelo Iniesta like magician vibe but still really great dribblers like I don't know I don't know how you characterize a step down from Marcelo better it's like um Oh, it's just I can't even think of a comparison. It's like the step down from Modric to Fede in possession right now. Like Fede has gotten way better. Is he Modric yet in possession? Maybe not quite that level of subtlety we see from uh, a Modric in possession. He's still great though. Um, yeah, a step down from Marcelo was really not an insult because everyone's a step down from Marcelo. Uh, I also put in the chat uh, my Modric article, which uh, I feel nicely vindicated on. All right. So back to the game. I, you were kind of listening to me and Sam, and then you listened to me blabber on a little bit. What did you feel like we missed? Oh, what did we miss? We talked about Lunin. I mean, Lunin's Courtois. That was a 0.5 XG chance, like just making it clear. That's like, that's based anything 0.5. Once you cross 0.2 or 3, if you save it, you're a maniac. Like you're just a great goalie. So if you're saving a 0.5, that's pretty nuts. Um, Yes, Vasquez being turning into Danny Alves again. I mean, sorry, wrong person. I meant Kafu. Yeah. Please, please don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could edit that that part, bro. I'm so sorry. Uh man, I even had that in the piece, the Davies piece. Sorry, I compared him. I'm, I apologize, everyone. This is my apology. Um, please accept it. You know, if I have to I hope I don't get fined or well Va- Vasquez uh did his part for sure. Uh definitely unlucky for that goal to be disallowed cuz you know went all the way back to the Nacho foul which I think was the correct call. It took 10 years to t- to to make the call but it was the correct call. Um I there were probably other moments that I could I don't know. Like every every game I'm just mind blown about what I'm seeing with the referees. So I don't even know what to say anymore. I'm just desensitized to how bad they are. Not with that call in particular, but just throughout the game. There was a lot of just bad challenges from Sevilla that went unpunished. Um I mean I don't know if there I have I have much much to add on top of that, plus the cruise freak out, which we already mentioned, but I'm glad we beat Ramos just because like I love the guy, but you can't just let him come and take points off you twice in his last season at Sevilla. And if we drop points today I do think it would have swung momentum a little more because no Bellingham, no Hoselu, and um, Barcelona then making up two points on us. And I thought that would have been, I thought that was a huge win in the context of like, if we're going to go on to win trophies this season, even despite all the injuries, you still need games that you somehow claw through 
so that you have that points in the bank. I thought this was big. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like one of the biggest wins of the season. Like, just at this point with those guys out, because they'll be back. Jude will be back. Hosolu will be back. Um, and I don't like there's an international break coming up, I think. So we're not really worried about like players missing time after the international break. That's when we're going to get Militao, Courtois, Bellingham's going to be 100%. Hosel will be 100% in March. Um, so, I mean, just let's look at our fixtures right now. March 16th is our last game before the break, I think. So we go pretty heavy. So we got Valencia, Leipzig, Salta, Osasuna, and then we have a break for the international break. I just hope the thing is like I'm where I'm skeptical is like every time I look forward, it's like, okay, in, in three weeks, two weeks, we're going to have Jude back. We're going to have everyone healthy. And I just don't know like what's going to happen in those two, three weeks. So we just hope. We got to worry about what's in our control. Right. And yeah, I mean, we, we may never be healthy this season, but you know, that's not in our control. We just got to, what is crazy. I thought was, um, I guess I didn't even fully clock. How many is Carvalho missing the next two games too? No, it okay. wasn't a straight red. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm checking. Um, so I think if you look at the last five games, <laughs> it's actually really funny. Look at the last five games: one nil against Sevilla, one one Rayo, beat Leipzig, beat slap Girona, drew against Atleti. I think you would be okay drawing to Rayo and Atleti if you had to pick two games you don't win of those five. I pick those because you need to beat Girona so you have the cushion in the title race. Atleti are the worst. I want to beat Leipzig because it's the Champions League. Come on. Like, you don't want to mess with the Champions League. Like, you don't want to be where Arsenal are right now, which we could have been just down 1-0 going back home. And then today, I don't know. It's just Ramos, man. He's just <laughs> – like, I love like I love him on our team, but playing against him, it's like, all right, I want to clown on you the same way I wanted to beat everyone when you were on my team. And um, just the satisfaction of him getting away with dropping points against us, like – with us taking points off us twice would have been too much, especially when we could use him. So um, I think just from an emotional perspective, this last five games went exactly as we needed. Um, the next game, I'm honestly quite scared for the next game too. Um, Valencia, we're, we, Lunin saved us against Valencia. Lunin becoming Courtois is like kind of turning into a big deal. It's, I mean, today is that point blank save on Oliver. Torres was unreal. That was just like those are the saves that Courtois would make where he single handedly like kept us in games. It's rare for a goalkeeper to single handedly keep you in games. And Lunen is right now playing at that level. It's been a godsend, like incredible. Um, and in huge contrast to Inaki Pena, if if like you swap Lunen and Inaki Pena just in terms of like output, we would be second. And they would be first, which I think is insane to think about that Lunin has been that decisive. Well, this, this is just not only Lunin and not to take take credit away from Lunin. Lunin has been amazing. But our whole team, like our whole our whole depth chart has basically been awesome. Think about all the like the things that I have to, to answer to Diego about. Like Diego's like, well, you got like, you know, we were missing this player and that player and Ter Stegen is that like, dude. No one is talking about our injuries because we're winning. No one's talking about Courtois being injured because Lunin is playing amazing. No one's talking about uh, Militao and Alaba being injured because Rudiger is playing out of his mind. And then too many filling in at center back. And then Brahim filling in for, for Jude's shoulder injury. And then again, this this time, like our depth, our bench has been fantastic, man. So we got to give an ode to the bench and Carlo for keeping this team afloat amid all the injuries. It's been, it's been pretty amazing. Um, just in the context of the, the games you mentioned and the, how we draw points against Atleti, it, I agree with you in that if, I guess if you're going to pick and choose where you're going to draw points, Atletico basically circled the game against us on the calendar and underperformed in most of the other games. And then <laughs> they just figured us out. And it's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll drop two points there. Well, we Not also, ideal. We played, but... we played a team with two of the best strikers for heading the ball without any of our center backs the second time. And the first time we played them after playing Barca in the final. So like 
their their rep is just living even their rep against us this season is living off some very questionable foundations in my opinion it's really like it's really funny like they like they they beat they beat Alaba in the air the first game and then by the last game we had them so figured out that they could barely draw even though we didn't have center back so i just thought that whole progression is funny i still don't count the copa del rey game we had a rest disadvantage like a big one it was a huge disadvantage and um we beat them an extra time in january so i just think it's hilarious man you're it's just a meme like did they lose today or they drew today to I'd like to go. um they drew against almeria almeria are a funny one because um everyone was, was they're weird and they haven't won but they pretty much pushed us barca girona and atleti all the way and um I think that's crazy. But well, back to what you were saying. Well, Sid, Sid Lowe put out an interesting tweet. And I kind of had a similar experience watching them because I, I try to watch as much at Arribas as possible. They're kind of like the best bad team in a while. Like they come close a lot, but they're just, their record is abysmal. Um, yeah. And the Girona win was, I mean, a, a part of being important for obvious reasons. It was super important because it effectively ended Girona's morale for the season. Michel comes out after the game, waves the white flag. He said, you know, we're not on this level. And uh, it, it kind of started to put a barrier between us and up until that point was what our main rivals were in the league, which was Girona. Now Barca are picking it up a bit. Uh, and so I think it, it was huge for us to get the W tonight and not drop two points because everyone says La Liga's over, man. Things change quickly. I'm not saying we would have lost it. But I'm just saying that you want to keep the cushion because within one week it can go from it can it can all all of a sudden be shaved to five points, and then you got to all of a sudden the next classical really matters. You don't want to be putting yourself in that position. Um, we draw points to Valencia. We might draw, especially without Jude and Rosalu. They're both out, and this gives us the cushion to go do that. I think Valencia are actually a pretty tough game with everyone we have out. To be honest, you um, already know what that game is going to be. It's going to be a shit show. It's going to be them kicking the shit out of Vinny. And the crowd getting into it, it's gonna be it's gonna be disgusting football. Oh, it's at Valencia, and Netflix is filming this one. Oh my god, this is gonna be box office. Netflix is filming this one too. You hear about that, Vinicius? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, damn, we're gonna get to see it all in the documentary in 2025. Whatever happens on Saturday. So, hey, at least we get to see this one. Like, if they do something crazy, it's gonna be on camera. It's gonna be in the Vinny documentary talking about how he carried us to the Champions League and La Liga in this season without Benzema. So it'll be great. Let's take a quick super chat, Sid. It's from Sheikh Hatiri. He says, Hala Marid, subscribe on Patreon or YouTube, everybody. Great suggestions, Shay. Uh, so tomorrow, guys, we're going to, tomorrow's Monday, right? Yeah, tomorrow, we're going to, me and Lucas are going to be recording a show only for members. If you want access to it, it's called El Dia de Suez. It's the, it's the segment we shamelessly copy from the famous Spanish TV show. We just basically reflect on the game a day later. That's only for members. We do that after every single game, even the midweek games, patreon.com slash managing Madrid. Or if you're not able to use patreon in your country you can simply join the memberships tab on youtube please go and do that all right so what else did we miss uh i don't think we missed too much uh let me let's just go see some of the top i always like seeing what mark stat shows just the relative measure of the different players in the team um i forgot to to check mark stats i also forgot to check angelotti's post game quotes which uh, undoubtedly are finished now so i'll i'll, I'll look that up while you look that up yeah so <clears throat> here we have um cruz yeah, like you, I heard you talking about him before I came on. Um, by far, most on ball value added as a passer. Rodrigo up there too. I thought Rodrigo was good again. Just like if he was like a little faster, released the ball a little better. Like times when he's arriving um, wide, especially situations where he's the widest man in transition. And he just like kind of runs out of ideas sometimes, just takes to the touchline and shoots. I wish he was like a little more aggressive, but I thought otherwise in possession, this was a very fun game from him, no doubt. Um, like just tricky when you don't have your strikers. And then Furland is shown as plus point two. I think that might reflect his involvement. I guess second half too, he started getting more into the box. We really started sending it. Um, so that's interesting because the first half, I didn't notice him as much. Brahim is still shown as decent. He's just Navas for Sevilla. Um, yeah, I mean, Cruz just shows up as better than everyone. And Furland actually doesn't show up as bad in the whole totality of the game i feel like i zoomed in too much on what i saw from him in the first half where 
no doubt we were just passing it side by side once we got to a certain point in the final third and he was part of that reason um but what, what were your thoughts on on mendy overall i thought in the first half um I just thought, like, again, maybe it's just confirmation bias where I saw someone with a good tweet who said it. But, like, La Liga Systems on Twitter said um, that basically he feels Rodrigo and Vinny are beating their man every time. But just numerically, if Ferland doesn't join them and also contribute to those movements, then we're just going to pass back. So it felt like we were taking two steps forward on the left wing, then taking a step or step and a half back again and again. And um, in the second half, we just started committing more players forward, just started getting more desperate. It was... um, not too tactical. I just thought they started arriving instead of worrying about what Sevilla will do in transition. So yeah, that's my thought on Mendy. I mean, Mendy's solid. I think he's overall playing some of his best football since the Champions League season, like just overall uh, in the last couple of years. So I've been overall a fan. Um, did he have that one moment in our own box, the the Zidane? Moment? <laughs> I, I so I don't remember uh, that. I the one thing that I remember in two thousand like. The 2020, 2021 range, something that me, Matt, and Om used to always laugh about is he would always have this one thing every game where deep in our own half, he would basically switch the play under pressure with his right foot. But it was like basically a cross into our own box that would put so much pressure on our defenders to deal with. He had one of those today, but it was actually good. Like it, it cleared the entire... Um, pressing line and and it was fine. I like so just on Mendy. I thought I, I I've liked his performances for the past month or so. Um, I don't think he was like spectacular today, but I think I liked his performance in in theory. And what I mean by that is that I think his advanced position, even though he can't do that much damage from a talent perspective in the final third, just his presence at least created some space for Vinny to work with, which was important. Now that offensive production would go to another level if that presence was Kamavinga or theoretically Davies, you know? Um, But at least just him, sometimes just him being there, even though he's not that good offensively helps. Um, so th- it's, this is a good super chat to bring up because I was actually going to talk about this now anyway. Uh, Zafri says thoughts on Arda being pulled after the goal. I actually don't know what you mean by that. I, oh, here's but, what happened. Um, Arda was, oh, he was uh, going to come on? He was warming up and then Ceballos came on instead or uh, in spite of whatever is going to happen. Maybe over him or maybe they just didn't bring on Arda at all and brought Ceballos on anyways. I don't. I don't know. Actually, that was Ceballos not warming up before the goal too. Uh, oh, he was. He was. He was. He was warming up when when Modric was warming up earlier. Okay, so that just seems like you know you need a goal, you throw on Arda. You don't need a goal, don't throw on Arda. Like um, he's an attacker, and I mean yes, you could throw on a young nineteen year old to go resist the press, take some challenges. But do you really want him doing that for ten minutes? Do you really want him like? inviting slide tackles for a few minutes i don't that's exactly what he was going to do um we can criticize it but that's the that's probably no more situations in football where you're going to get kicked at as often as when you're up one nil in like the 85th minute so um uh, I'm, I'm just trying to like catch up on the ghoul there stuff i i guess i missed that but i i it's probably it, it was i think it, yeah basically he was warming up and then he just didn't get on i think when we were when we had scored and we maybe needed a different outlook. We needed defensive tracking instead of um, uh, the, the creative element in chasing a goal. Um, so Ancelotti said before the game, and by the way, happy birthday, Arda Guler. He turns 19 today. I know some compilations resurfaced that the last time Arda Guler faced Sevilla, he was with Fenerbahce. And he put in a fantastic performance. I think it was the Europa League. Angelotti said before the game that he is good enough to start for Real Madrid, but his problem is essentially that there are so many other players who are good. Where do you stand on that? I, I, I think... We may see him against Valencia. Like, <laughs> we may. Um, like, it's, it's true it's too tight a rotation. I was hoping... I mean, today was one of the main games we could have seen him with Hoslu out and we didn't. It's just a weird game though. Like 
like if you're if you're concerned about Goulers like like getting tackled by the wrong players, you just don't bring him on against Ramos and Sevilla. Like, yeah, the, the rotation's too tight. I'm, I agree with you. Like, there's no there's no point. Like, what are we gonna debate? I'm not gonna write an essay on why there's five players ahead of him. Like, we know that. But with the injuries, this is his moment. And um, you know, we're probably gonna get these questions every week until Hoslu and Jude are back together, which which I think is fair. Um would you have brought Guler on over Modric? Uh, how could I sit here and say I would have after we saw what we saw? Well, but just think about the profiles and what we've been talking about Modric all week. Like, he made the right choice. Um, I think he's protecting Arda from, like, having XX expectations played on him. You don't want to make him someone who's expected to decide every moment he comes on and... There's a hierarchy like Brahim. I mean, we've talked about this, but Brahim needed to decide like so many games in a row before he was like accepted as okay. Like Brahim is one of us. Like he's Lunin too. Towards. Yes, Lunin as well. So Arda has not decided anything, but like the one thing he really did. I mean, has he decided anything since Atleti? Atleti, he just made that run that opened up the space for Carvajal to cross. I always go back to that. He just made the right time. Position. That was the Super Cup one. Yes, yes. He just it, it was just an overlap, nothing crazy, but it gave Carvajal a split second to get the cross off. Um he he's put in a couple good balls, right? In a couple of the games he's come on or Yeah, it's like he's, I mean, he's obviously we can obviously see the talent. I just think there as much as Ancelotti will say that he is good enough to start. I do there's very clearly different levels of trust with him. Like I just think there's also, I mean, the physical aspect too that some were worried about. Like, can he keep up with the flow of the game and be in game match fitness kind of mode right away against these really physical teams in La Liga? That might be a concern. And for that reason, you might want to ease him in. But I mean, like, he's been back for over a month now. Like, so at some point, uh, you got to figure. Now, it's funny, like, you, you talk about the sheer amount of players. I know right now Ceballos' stock is pretty low. I know it's low. He hasn't been playing really well. But keep in mind, last season, and I still feel this way, I, I actually am a really big Ceballos believer. I think like as far as like fifth, sixth choice midfielders go, he's probably the best fifth, sixth choice midfielder in the world. He's really, he, the amount of energy he has, his ability to progress the ball, to press, work hard defensively, I like his profile. He's a good player to have in your rotation. Uh, I'm not saying that he's like bonafide should be ahead of Arda Goulet forever. I'm just saying like he's a really good, important player who has given us a lot and was unbelievable in that Champions League run in 2022 off the bench as well. Um, so there's that. And next year, it doesn't get any easier. Next year, it gets more cluttered. So that, but we kind of had that conversation. We'll have that conversation a million times from now until next year, but it's going to get even harder next year. Someone will probably have to go from the midfield. I mean, Modric will probably go. He might join Carlos coaching staff, though who, it's hard to say now. It'd be just such a meme if we like draw a game next season against Sevilla and like nobody comes and scores the long shot. Modric is sitting and we're like, damn, should have just brought him off. But um, I thought Alvaro coming on was interesting just because we were again scared of Sevilla aerially. Which I think is warranted. You don't want to let that man get loose, Sergio Ramos, and you want to keep your best defenders on him, which means you want to get height around your best defenders. You know, tell me, because <laughs> I see some people in the chat like making fun of that. But um, to be honest, that, I think that's how Sevilla wanted the game to go. I think they wanted, yes, they got that loon in the save, but I think they would have been content with um, like like Ramos hit the post against us last time. I'm sure they had a bunch of set plays planned when when the corners came, and. I'm, I'm sure they did. I'm, I'm sure they did. Like, just think about Ra Like, it's Ramos. Like, he probably spent all week looking at our center backs. Like, all right, like, cross it to me this way. Do this play. Do this play. Probably had five plays ready. When we conceded a corner in the 90th minute, you just know Ramos was like, <laughs> in his head, was like, my whole life has come. I've been preparing for this moment my whole life. 90th minute at the Bernabeu. This is, this is already written in the scriptures. He, he hit the crossbar against us late on a set piece in the Piz one and you just know he was licking his lips. Thank God we dodged that bullet. I I was I was kind of scared in that moment, to be honest with you. For sure, for sure. Um, for sure. Uh, what about... Did you have any notes on Chiu Many? He's just good. I don't think he's played a bad game this season. Like, maybe one. 
like he we might have had one game where we're like hey i thought he could have been better i don't think he's played a bad game like the center back against atleti fine but like too many is a lot like fede maybe today fede is like this was maybe the one or like how many games we played 40 games this is maybe the one or two out of the 40 games where we said okay fede's role maybe could have been slightly different and um, too many and Fede have been basically perfect every game they've played, I thought, this season. So I have nothing to add about him. Like, he steps up when he needs to. He, he's just so good. Like, we're so lucky to have him. There, It's him and Declan Rice who can defend and pass at this level. And we're lucky to have one of the two who can do that at DM. Rodri's great, but he can't defend at this level. So, yeah. And I know you pointed out that he had to arrive a little higher. I thought we overall, outside that one chance we gave up in the 51st minute again, we didn't give up too much after like we played the balance of cat and mouse of press up or sit back perfectly um so i love that yeah my only thing on too many was that i think there were a couple defensive sequences where he could have tracked better and defended better on a cross um we had it was one of the first half in the 34th minute i can't remember which Sevilla player um had a wide open header uh and it was because too many stopped tracking. I think there were there are moments like he has that I think he could clean up a little bit, which is just sometimes just not tracking um, runners into the box. Other than that, I thought he was good. I think we exhausted it, man. Um, weirdly uneventful game for large stretches. I remember looking up at like just before Mordred scored, and I was like, how is it already... 80th minute like what happened nothing happened why is this game going by so fast um so it wasn't like this hugely eventful game the i mean the events were a lot of var checks 10 minutes for the referee getting subbing himself off that's about it last thing our dad yeah if courtois comes back we're at the point where you wonder like are we rushing him are we messing with Lunin? Like, you can't really, you don't. I mean, I think when we were a worse team, like the 19, 20, and 2021 teams, we were just worse. We weren't going to get anywhere without Hazard. So I thought that was okay. He comes back at the end of the season. You start him. Sergio Ramos, that was that didn't work too well. But I think it's safe to say, even if Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea... Even if we didn't have Ramos in that lineup, I think we were going to lose to Tuchel's Chelsea that day. They were just, they knew what was coming for them. Um, but the Ramos and Hazard incidents, when we started them after coming back from injuries at the end of seasons and Champions League ties, man, we're getting close to maybe having that combo about Militao and Courtois. Mm. I think Militao, I mean, like, Militao is, I guess, a relatively easy one. Like, we're going to see how he looks. He, if As long as he's as athletic and fit, as Nacho, like as long as he's jumping, moving the same way, fine. Courtois just feels like a different thing. Like reflexes, they're still going to be there. But um, if we don't win, I think this year we'll see so much scrutiny. If we're like, we're going against Man City, Arsenal, Inter, and we're playing Courtois over Luna and we don't go through, man. I don't, I don't envy Carlo in that case. I So my take on it is this. I think there's two different urgency levels. I mean, Tao is a higher level of urgency because I don't know. I'm, I'm still, I thought actually Nacho had a good game today, but there Nacho just hasn't been reliable this year consistently on Courtois. And, and we know that Ancelotti is not going to start too many over Nacho. If Nacho was healthy in a, in a big game at the center back position. I think with Courtois, we just we should just table it. We 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 know it's not urgent anymore because of the way Luden is playing. It would be a nightmare if Courtois came back and like we rushed him. And do you remember like earlier, actually like a couple months ago, he had a quote where he said, "I am already not, I've already said I'm not playing the Euros with Belgium." Would that change if he starts playing again at the end of the uh, season for us? Hmm. It might change the discourse around that with the national team because he said I'm Belgium not. Belgium gonna... just suck though. Belgium just suck. Well, I'm just saying like it would change the discourse because he said I'm not going to be ready for the Euros. So if he now all of a sudden he comes back for Real Madrid, that discourse might change. But I I just feel like let's just because it's not that urgent anymore. Let's just let Courtois completely heal till next year. Like don't risk it. 
having said that, I'm I'm pretty sure the medical staff are competent enough to be like, we're not putting these guys out unless we know for sure. And maybe they'll know for sure. He's hundred percent, and he's not like hundred percent in form, and like, or even if he's hundred percent and match fit. Or, or even if he's in good form and he just doesn't make the the game defining save that Lunin has made this season, it's just a funny place to be in. Um, yeah, for sure. No, that's the thing. Now, the different a different question would be if Courtois comes back to his best, then that's a no brainer, right? Because Courtois' best is better than Lunin's best. We know that for a fact. But we just have no guarantee that that's what Courtois is going to be when he comes back. And because we if to, to tell you what if this was if we only had Kepa this conversation would be much different it would oh, be yeah. much more challenging to be like okay maybe we should, like we don't want to rush him back but if Kepa would be second right now or probably tied for a second <laughs> or well that's the thing like but but because we've seen Lunin like with the level of urgency is completely different um yep, let's shift sure. gears slightly sure. Anthony Tharp super chat says do you think we sell Lunin with a cheap buyback clause this summer So let's look at Courtois' age about the buyback first. So Courtois' age is 31. Um, the buyback really comes down to whether there, I think there are two components to the buyback. So like, I think there's a high probability we sell or loan him out um, for sure. I think the size of the fee determines the buyback. So if it's like a small fee, then throw the buyback in because we're essentially, we've done this before, like with Morata to Juve. Um, I don't even know if we if, did we loan Morata to Juve and buy him back or did we buy him back for cheap? Let me look it up. Um, I think that was a buyback. Okay, I'm uh, pretty sure. Do, yeah, if we do it with Kubo this year, um, let me look it up. Morata Real Madrid buyback. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a thirty million buyback clause after he led them to the final. That's just so funny. But, um, well, remember we 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 sold him for a lot of money to Chelsea, right? Yes, after the, and then he, he came back, scored 20 goals for us. Then we sold him for a crazy amount to, for double to Chelsea. So that was great. So that's how we, if we sell Lunin for cheap, it's because we pick a team where we think he gets platform to go win titles. And then we get him back for, for <laughs> less than the market rate. And we sell him for cheap because that team is willing to make that deal where they know it's, it's a deal with the devil. They know what they're doing. Like we don't have, we don't get this guy. He's not helping us long term. Do you want him for now? And if he's any good, he's going back. Um, so do you, it really comes down to whether Lunin's market looks more like that, where teams aren't bidding so much to the point where we feel we can get more back from him if we play this game. Um, or if someone bids like 30 million, 35 million, I think we sell him outright. I, I don't know if like the market for Lunin, it's hard to say. I just don't know what the evaluation of Lunin is because goalies go through up and down years. Like Ter Stegen was great last year. He's been okay this year. Um, you know, Courtois had obviously a couple of great years. Wasn't perfect at the start of his career. Obviously, he was great in 1920. Um, but I just don't feel like goalies are always consistent. So I don't know what the market's going to be like. Like, is there going to be a team that looks at him and says, this is mini Courtois, bring him in right now. Let's start him, a top team. I'm not sure. So it's going to come down to the market. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's let go and that we move on to a new backup goalie because I think he's pretty much gone past the backup goalie tier. Like, you can't keep him there anymore. It's like if Camavinga was still like a complete backup, if Camavinga didn't start like so many games. Now he does. He starts a lot of the games. Um, but what do you think? I mean, he, he's clearly too good to stay without at least leaving on a loan to a good team as backup. It's the hardest, one of the hardest positions to fill for an elite club is backup goalkeeper. You're either overqualified or basically just someone who's not good enough to play. And in Lunin's case, he's overqualified. What I would do personally, because Courtois, as like you, you brought up his age, 31 for a goalkeeper might as well be 25. And that's yeah, was 34. This could be a different convo, but he's yeah. Not. Assuming Courtois comes back to his best, Lunin's not playing for years. What I would personally do, though, I don't want to lose him. I think I've seen enough this season. I'd be like, I want this guy. I, I don't want to leave this, lose this guy for good. If you can find an ideal situation, and to me, the ideal situation is basically what we did with 
Kubo, with Carvajal, with Brahim. Brahim was alone, but sell with rights. That's the most ideal thing to me. You guarantee that he goes somewhere and plays consistently, even if it's for two years, three years. Just have the option, have him an arm's length away as, as much as 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 best as you can. Because as as far as Courtois successors go, I mean he 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 right now the way he's playing, he's perfect. So I I, it. I just can't believe it. It feels like a dream. Like a it feels a lot like 2122. Except this is with backups. It just makes no sense. And I guess the team is better, but just feels so not real. And it feels so real because the way the Premier League title race is heating up. And all those teams are going to beat each other into the ground, whereas we have this cushion, getting a lot of those vibes. Um, I was just going over Ancelotti quotes, and there's nothing really interesting. Uh, I thought the Guler one was funny. He's like, if he doesn't understand why <laughs> I didn't bring him on, nothing will happen. No big deal. <laughs> Quote, I had one thought before the mortgage goal, and then after he scored, I changed my mind. I think Gulio understands that. And if he doesn't understand it, then nothing will happen. I don't have to give any explanations. Had a bunch of Modric praise. Says the contract extension is in his hands, just like Nacho and Cruz. It's up to them. The club has already offered it to them, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while, Sid. You haven't been on the podcast for a while. I just remembered. Oh, yeah. I've just been kind of tired. I um, just need to get other things done a lot of i want to work for one of these teams to be honest as you all know so that's my goal and i'm getting closer i want to like i want to be the one toppling i want to be the protagonist on the stage and it's a lot of stuff to be honest that like this is really a complete hobby at this point <laughs> like this is what i do to kind of unwind from my work to be honest which is um so that's why i don't I know if i should be offended or or be no. humbled or no, it's it's like well the I'm podcast is its hobby. This the side the side gig, the side quest. Well, it's just um this is my first year. I feel like I've been more involved. And um man, I don't know how you do it. I guess it's a full time job is the main thing. I it's like, tiring. It, it is, right? Yeah, it's, it's tiring. Tricky. Um I think what's it's, a big roster that it's can not tiring me. to watch football and talk about it, but I think it's what what it, where it does get tiring is the expectation knowing that you have to show up and turn your camera on and microphone on at a certain time. And if you don't, you've let everybody down basically. And so you don't have the option to be like, uh, guys, I'm, I want to take a nap. Like that's not an option. If I did that, it's, it would be, it would, it would just be bad. People would be angry. So it, it keeps you accountable in, in, in a certain way. It, that that's what makes it hard. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, just took a couple of weeks and I mean, lots more in the works. I'm trying to go and figure out how to turn who scored data more historically accurate, just using some proxy little tricks to like kind of get more information on how much passing, playmaking, dribbling we were seeing from some of the legends of the 2010s, like younger years of Marcelo, prime Modric. So because football ref cuts out at 2017-18. Yeah. And um, yeah, just thinking about that. Thinking about the Benzema Henri debate, I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> the things that happen on football Twitter are just mind blowing. Uh, have you have you checked out Stats Head yet? Uh, I mean, I, I have checked it out. I'm I'm not the one who downloads it for like data. Mehedi does that, so I don't like like I go to FB Ref, but I know Stat Head's queries are good. I'm actually going to be looking into it this week. Um, I'm going to be trying the free trial this week. I I tried the free t- trial, I, but I I mean I signed up for it, but I haven't uh, actually played around with it yet. And I keep getting emails from them saying, like, don't forget to 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 use the stats. Yeah, but it's, I it's, it's a lot to like it's a lot to go through. Yeah, I just mainly find like um who scored and football ref get their data from Opta. And a huge discrepancy is that like you go and it seems who scored like before 2017-18 um has like passes or um or who scored's passing doesn't include the medium passes that are in Opta's data set. It's the weirdest thing. So when you go to who scored um after 2017-18 on, you add up the short and long passes and you see um those are identical to whatever is in Football Ref's database, but there's no medium passes in there. So it's just like but then they have the data be from like all the 2010s without the medium passes. And so I'm trying to scheme up a way to um get my hands on that like 
one thing you can do is you can say for Marcelo, you could average Marcelo's medium passes and other metrics in 2017, 18, and then extrapolate that backwards. But that's a dirty way of doing it. I really just want to go take a look at Marcelo and just do some more historical analysis. So yeah, just been busy doing that. Um, and yeah, I got to check out Stathead for sure. Um, my check. my biggest wish list item is advanced analytics for the greats of the history of the in the history of the game. I want the progressive passes and key passes passes into the final third. Progressive carries of Zidane, Di Stefano. I want to know Fedeng Pushkas's expected assists. That's the stuff I'd be like super nerded out on if we got that ever. Would take yeah. an insane amount of work. Yeah, I mean, if someone could bankroll Stats Bomb to go and like do what they do now, but for like the last forty years, I feel like there has. That's to be- what I would be doing if I had Elon money. I would too. If it, or if I had like if one of these owners, if you want to market and control the narrative around the sport just bankroll that because then you get to decide like how good players from the past were you change the way the game in the gets talked about from past to future like thinking basketball does a great has done a great job of this with basketball they really influenced the way people looked at the game by just being so comprehensive and that's a bit of what we're trying to achieve with these historical profiles like um like i think we'll get close for the 2010s players we're not going to go be before that but yeah. i do think that when I'm done, um, when we're done with this left back series and progressing from there, we will have like we'll do a Modric profile. We'll look at his passes. We'll compare it to Xavi. We'll compare it to Busquets. We'll compare them to Rodri, Thiago. We'll be able to do those. Um, so, if comparing everything since Guardiola came onto the scene is something you wanted, that's something we I think we will see. Um, just fine tuning some of those measurements now. I don't want to, you know, what if Marcelo averaged like half the medium passes and I'm like using a proxy metric from 1718? That would be stupid it would be bad um so yeah we'll keep you all updated on that but um i've been thinking very historically too like i would love to, like it's just when a when a player is doing something i want to know how good is it relative to what's doing done this season how good is it relative to the last five ten years how good is it relative to every era in history those are the three questions that pop up and um just doing the davies analysis was so interesting like so many of his metrics are the same but there are some really big differences that show you how different they are in some key ways and yet Davies is like the 99th percentile in almost every metric for a fullback of the last five years. Yeah. Which is just, um, yeah, those things are fun. And I think fans love that too, because fans love just arguing over legacies. Like Benzema Henry, I thought the Benzema Henry debate today was really interesting. Not to take it away from the game, guys. Sorry. Um, but um, No, just, I mean, look, big, uh, big people love big picture stuff on the podcast, and we do too. Yeah, um, just 2003 Henry, just a quick note. He you could argue he had a better season than Benzema 21, 22. I didn't even realize this, but pretty, pretty close to identical in league rate of goals and assists while starting as a left winger. And um, he had even less help than Benzema. Benzema had Vinny. He had one guy score 14 and one guy score 10 next to him. That's it. And he was the only double digits, very similar rate, no help. And um, I also dribbled. I love Benzema, but he wasn't a dribbler. Like he was a phenomenal player, but he's not like, give him the ball, get out of the way and move in front of him. No, that's not what you do with him. Um, so the, the Henri Benzema thing, and, and to be clear, these are two, two of the greatest players in, in their position ever. So like respect to both of them. They're just two unbelievable players. I remember we, we had to visit this conversation of Henri versus Benzema way back when Zidane dropped the bomb where someone in the press room asked him, is Benzema the best striker in France football history? And he said, yes, for me, yes. And we're like, whoa, this guy played with Henri, he's friends with Henri. So we had to like go through it. I'm like, okay, is this true? Is he just saying this because um, he's coaching his player, and, and in a, which in which case, there's nothing wrong with backing your striker. Like I, I don't, I wouldn't blame him, even if he didn't truly believe it. I think at the time, my assessment was, I don't know if if Benzema quite matched what Henri did. Like when you think about 0-2, 0-3, 44 goals and assists, 
Benzema's never had a season like that numerically. 0405, 39, 0304, 36. Uh, like Henri had a four year stretch at Arsenal where he was literally unplayable. You could probably five year stretch. Where I think it shifted for me was when I saw Benzema's 2022 Champions League run and his play in overall competitions. That Champions League run is arguably, and I don't even know if it's arguable anymore when you reflect that. I think there's one Cristiano Ronaldo season which comes pretty close. Probably the greatest run by one player in a Champions League ever. And when I saw that, I was like, this guy's just on another level right now. But so now you, the, the discussion of like where their peaks were changed to me. At the time when Zidane said it, I, I was like, no, I don't think this is true. You look at the numbers, you look at the surrounding pieces that Henri had, you look at, the, you know, how when, when he got them to the Champions League final, his overall production was insane. But it shifted for me a little bit after Benzema's Ballon d'Or season. I'm just pulling up um, Zidane's quote here. So... For me, yes. I don't know. And that's, that's all he said. <laughs> it, was like, okay, it was a very I, small quote. I don't even think that's a fair comp then because Henri was, I love, you could call him a striker, but I think that's a little boxing him in as far as what he did. He did more. He played. Oh, Benzema too. Yes. I think Benzema, exactly. And I think that's why, um, like, but I think Benzema is much closer to a striker than Henri, I guess. It's like um, calling Mbappe, like Benzema is more of a striker than Mbappe, would you say? Mm, yes and i'd say mbappe is much more similar in the zones he uses as Henri. i don't even know if he's i don't i'm not sure he's as good as a playmaker um has the speed and the finishing i don't think he's a good playmaker or creator on the ball but um i just think Henri is like a lot closer to a winger and um you know it's hard to compete with the winger's impact if a winger can create as many goals and assists as a striker and do it from the wing um I just thought, see, I agree with you. It's just I didn't realize that Ben Henry's 0203 is numerically almost identical to Benzema's best season, 21-22. Um, but then you go look. It's superior, actually. Um, well, I think when I look at you, the, if you look at goals and assists together, it's 60. It's more total, but per 90, I believe it's like basically very similar. Maybe, maybe I'm off there actually. Per 90, it might be different. Um, you know what? Let's just pull this up. So I, I put per 90 in two competitions, but I'm just gonna look at the whole thing now. When I, look, I, I, playing against Henri was one of the most terrifying things I remember. As Amadeus says, he absolutely cooked us at the Bernabeu. Like it was, it was terrifying to play against. The guy is one of the legends for a reason of the game. I just still, even despite that, I don't think I've ever seen anything like what Benzema did in the 2022 range. All right, so going through it, Benzema, um, 59 goals and 3,900 minutes. Uh, four, 59 goals and assists in 3,900 minutes. Yeah, so, you're right. I was only looking at their domestic stats. I, I excluded the other competitions. I, I made a mistake. See, but that's where you could argue that th that might be more fair, though, when you look at supporting cast. And I know Benzema did it. Okay, fine. The, the fair thing to Benzema is, yes, he did it against ridiculous teams. Like, he did it against Man City, who at the time, Man City and Liverpool were considered two of the best teams ever, and we just knocked them out, which was insane. Um, I just think the that Henri had no help. So when you if you isolate the league... It is an interesting look. Like no I help mean, is a stretch too. I like we have to remember that he was part of the Arsenal Invincibles. That team was loaded with you know. You look at the Burke camps, the Perez, like they they had a good team. It wasn't you know. It's not quite. I mean, and and, and we have to remember this, Sid. But when we're talking about Benzema's greatest years, it was when he was at his most alone. Cristiano had gone. Bale had gone. He was basically him and taking young Vinny under his wing. And I think that's what made it so special. Like he went to a level that we hadn't seen before in his entire career. So I think when we're talking about help and no help, I think it's fair to say that you could argue at Arsenal team, um, you know, he might have had more help than Benzema did. That season, it seems like, like, Ber I don't think Bergham scored that season. <laughs> Like, I don't think he scored. I, I just mean, like, he sounds really cool. But when I look at He sounds up, cool? What does that mean? Well, I, I I can't remember the specifics of year to year. I just remember Burkamp as a figure who was unreal. I, I, I don't remember Burkamp the year to year specifics. And also, like, his, his 
it's not his goals. Like he's one of those who's also impactful outside the goals. Let's for see. sure. For um, sure. Fourteen from Perez in the Premier League, fine. Um, and then five in the FA Cup. All right, fine. So then. 16 from Perez in 35 appearances, 9 from Freddie Lundberg, um, 13 yeah. from Sylvain Wiltford, then 32 from Henri. So I guess Wiltford. he got two, he got 29 goals from Robert Topirez and Wiltford. He got 11 assists from Patrick Vieira. I mean, it's all right. I mean, who's, who's, what's his name? Sylvain Wiltford. <laughs> Sylvain Wiltford. I, he was the guy, I think, who's, uh, who scored the equalizer in Euro 2000 in the final. Oh. Yeah, in like the the last second of the game, um, so uh, okay. let, yeah, I I think uh, I still think, you know what, what, it's again when we had that discussion earlier. This was years ago when Zidane was still coaching the team when he brought that up, and I've I've said this a few times. No player has shot up the historical rankings in my book than more than Karim Benzema in the last few years. Like I had to like basically rewrite so much in my book because. Benzema out of nowhere just catapulted himself to probably the third greatest player of all time in Real Madrid history. He surpassed Pushkas. Up until that point, Pushkas was ahead of him. And so it, it completely changed and shifted um, the way I, I viewed Benzema historically after that 2022. Not only that, like it was basically anything post Ronaldo, Benzema went to another level, but specifically that season. Um, anyways, long story short, I, I think Benzema has surpassed Henri in that, in that conversation. I should have mentioned that from the top, but I think it, I don't think that it was the case necessarily when Zidane made that claim. That's my point. Uh, let's get to a couple more super chats. Varun Krishnan says, thanks for being the voice of reason and keeping up all the hard work guys. I appreciate you, Varun. Thank you so much for your support over the years. You know, I always appreciate you. Um, Decode says Benzema achieved what Messi couldn't, with Griezmann, Coutinho, Dembele, etc., he carried alone and started a new generation with Champions League. Our Henri can only dream what I don't know what Messi has to do with this, but of course Messi 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 in the Champions League, uh, he's lucky to carry he'd be lucky to carry Pele oh, and Maradona. What Benzema did was for sure something most footballers probably dream of doing, but football is so hard, you rarely get the opportunity to even be on a stack team or like you're never guaranteed to win a CL. So, like, no player ever, like, yeah, you dream of it, but the reality of carrying a worse team to a big title like that is something, yeah, like, very few players could have ever done. I, I think um, it's just the body of work that Andre has, like, over the years, like, how long he carried Arsenal, if you look at how many years he did it, and the fact that it, he was just a left winger, like, like people miss, like, he, he dribbled, like, he like he, he did things other than striker things. He Like, Benzema was a false nine, fine, he was a 9.5. I think a winger is more impactful in build-up play in the first and middle third and final. I honestly think a winger is more impactful overall for a team's build-up and ability to destabilize the opposition than any false nine. I think a false nine is the most a striker can do to make themselves more useful. But you're a winger. It's just easier to access you. You're out wide. If you lose the ball, it's not a big deal. You have a touchline next to you. So there's more license to take risks. And like, like, Henri was Benzema against Atleti on the touchline. I feel like he had a lot more of those moments where he was just going at guys. Um, that's all I'm saying. I'm, you know, the best achievement? Sure, Benzema had a better achievement. Um, I thought Ali was harsh. You know, we had Ali on. He was saying he thinks it's not close that between Henri's best season and Benzema's. He thought Henri's 03 is actually way better, which is what prompted me to look at the metrics. Well, so, the, so um, just quickly on this comment, actually. Um. I, I agree what Benzema has achieved is probably historically greater in that season than anything else we've seen in the Champions League. You don't you won't find me disagreeing with that. What I have problems with comments like this is that it it belittles other great players. The the idea of like Henri can only dream, he literally carried Arsenal to the Champions League final. Like he did it, like Arsenal. And and he cooked us at the Bernabeu in the process. Like this is a great player. Like we're talking about one of the greats of all time. We don't need to be little and say things like Henri can only dream just to to praise a certain player. Um, <clears throat> all right, Sid. I just saw someone say I disrespected Bert Camp. So let me just go check real quick. Bert Camp was one of the greats, man. Bert Camp is is truly one of the greats. Yeah, he was good. I guess. I mean, was he like a false nine? Okay, he was a main striker, then a second striker. 
That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, could he, do both. Because he wasn't not. You would often see Henri kind of like coming in from the left wing and uh, and Burkham playing centrally, but they were interchangeable too. But Bur- Burkham was more of the main, main striker in, in those years. So he was like the Roberto Firmino of their time. That's fair to say. I think that's good. A better version, I'd say. Let's see. So, um, looking at goals and appearances. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Firmino did not get anywhere near. Okay, I didn't realize. I, I thought Firmino had scored way more, but he only scored like 130 goals in his whole playing career from 2009 to 23 before Saudi. Um, Bergkamp was at 200. I apologize for the slander. <laughs> hey, I love. I'm, I mean, I think people know I change my opinions pretty quickly when I look at more data, and so I love. Like, I try not to slander because, you know, you ever think about how, like, Modric feels when you go and, like, nitpick, like, he sees, like, a ar- big article. Like, someone, you, you're a player and you see these articles, like, analyzing your goddamn, like, XG and, like, your rolling averages. Must be so weird, man. Like, it's something I've felt weird about. Like, I still comment, but I'm just so aware, especially just knowing that some of these players do read your stuff. Like, even if they don't read every single one, it gets back to them. And um, that, it, it's just funny, man. <laughs> Like, you know, Burkamp, if you're ever listening, I don't mean I haven't seen enough of you, man, to really know. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Burkamp is creating a burner account right now. He's gonna tweet at you. Uh did you see uh you saw I I, I know you saw it. What were your thoughts on JJ Reddick's whole uh uh everything? Just like his comments recently. I, I love him. I, I loved what he's saying. I was like I love how he I, I actually thought it was hilarious that he attacked Doc Rivers. I mean, see, but he's JJ Reddick. I don't know. It's, it's different, man. I guess he didn't win a ring, but man, he switched at the highest level. I haven't done that yet. So it's different coming from me. But I thought from Reddick, that was big because in NBA circles, there's like, there's a lot of hate towards Doc. And then there's a small sliver of people who actually defend him. And actually, there's a niche, and I'm not closed off to this, who say he's a decent coach. He's one of the best options the Bucs had. That I agree. He was probably one of the better options the Bucs could have had midseason. But the idea that um, Doc Rivers is like not accountable for all his teams' his playoff losses over the last 20 years, I think that's a little excessive. And JJ was just good for crushing that. Um, that's what you're talking about, right? He did something after that where he um, – what did he do after that? So okay, so it was it was more the aftermath of all the Doc Rivers stuff. So um, he was kind of he verbalized something that I've 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 tried not to complain about publicly, but I have probably hinted at at complaining about it, but mostly internalize it. He said that basically fans don't really want to be educated. So he was saying that like if I can make a video, and I forget what example he used but he said i can make a video dissecting this play and the pick and rolls and how many pl- times this player cuts to the rim and does this defensive action and stuff and it'll get forty four thousand views but i can make a video creating drama about a coach and that gets half a million views and he was basically complaining about what we consume and i agree with him but there's nothing you can really do about it you kind of have to ride the wave instead of complaining about it and i've always said like that's true, and it's frustrating for me too. Like, I, I I was having a conversation. I was having this conversation with Sid Lowe uh, uh, a month or two ago. We were sitting and we were just talking about like the media hysteria, and I was like, I don't. You think I want to log on and talk about Mbappe every day? I actually don't. But why do I? Because that's what's paying the bills. And so, like, now you twist it and you and you talk about like, okay, tactical fit and this and that, and you try to bring an intelligent conversation and, and not like kind of like the brain dead Mbappe dialogue that generally happens every day, but you, you can't really do anything about it. You just have to kind of ride the wave and do your best, but you just have to capitalize on the niche. Like the people listening to us now, the people who are live on YouTube with us now, the people who are listening at home, they're the niche nerds who care about, you know, Real Madrid on this level like we do. And so you just have to be okay with getting a smaller share of the pie because you could have millions of people listening but are they really fans? Well, and th- this goes back to the whole 1,000 true fans model that, um, what's his name? Something Kelly. Uh, the guy who was on Tim Ferriss for a while. He basically, he put out this whole thing saying, you don't need a million fans because you could have a million fans and they can't buy, they don't buy into you. They don't care about you. But what you need is 1,000 true fans. And, and that's kind of like what I've been trying to convey to creators who are like coming up 
Like, how do I, how do I monetize this? How do I actually build something? And like, you just have to be okay with getting a smaller piece of the pie. If, if you want to, if you want to do this. I think what JJ said is interesting because he also then name dropped like five of the biggest like analyst accounts that are massive, like Brady Hawk on Miami Twitter, or, um, you know, he brings on Nikias and Steve Jones, or uh, he named dropped thinking basketball and thinking basketball. Uh, I think you create, you can create something so good where you reach an exit velocity, like thinking basketball, where I think their videos are now on the NBA channel too. Let me pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm super happy for Ben and his team. You know, I I really liked talking to those guys over the years. I mean, not all of them, but one of his team members I've spoken to over the years, really smart guy, Mike De La Rosa. Um, I've always liked their approach and they just stayed at it. You have to be perfectionist and reach an exit velocity where the algo kind of just puts you out to the world. You become a narrative and authority. Um, and it's hard because what Ben and Thinking Basketball do, they cover every team in the league. That is one of the hardest jobs in content creation. They, they're there because it's hard. I don't think people realize how stressful the – it's like basically a team film room. You're basically in a team film room. All those guys, they they could get hired by a team any day. You're basically doing like a role you would for a team, which is very intense. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't think fans want to learn. I agree. Um, I think most fans want to – or I think even if they do, they want to be fed at their level, which is very primal, instinctive – things they've seen that you can kind of act on with the primordial brain before you get to more sophisticated frameworks. Um, I don't think it's a big deal anymore. I've kind of like, I feel like you can mix both. You can be serious sometimes and then kind of be a jokester and go off like JJ did there. Um, I liked it. I liked it. I like that JJ was the one who chose to win because he has that rep as like the more balanced head and I like it, but come on, JJ, just say what you mean sometimes. And I loved it. Uh, let's shift gears for a second. Zafri says, did you all see the tweet on who the best Champions League player is? I'm assuming this is the one I actually quote tweeted and gave my opinion on. <clears throat> it was basically a question of like, who was the greatest Champions League player yeah, of all time? Yeah. There was a couple of Messi's. There was someone said Clarence Seydorf, which I love me some Clarence Seydorf, but uh, he's not getting in this conversation. Seydorf competes with Modric. But, like, not Ronaldo. <clears throat> I think he's, like, compared to... Mo I think if you had to... Like, when I'm looking at Pantheon CL midfielders, I think Seedorf is up there with Luca. Like, one of the few maybe is right there. What Mordic has done has surpassed Seedorf, man. And I love Seedorf. I really love Seedorf. Like, he's an amazing, amazing midfielder. High IQ. Very intelligent. Technically gifted. Uh, but to me, what I, I what I couldn't believe was, like... It, this it's actually irrefutable. It's not even up for debate. Well, this is not a conversation of who is the goat. You can debate the goat all you want. The Champions League great goat is irrefutable. Most goals, most assists, most clutch moments, and then the trophy at the end. It's case closed until someone comes and wins more Champions League titles than Ronaldo, scores more goals than him, and has more assists than him, and has more big ball moments. We can't have this conversation. It's not a question. We don't even entertain the idea. You want to go into another debate about who is the greatest player of all time? You can have that debate. But the Champions League GOAT, the greatest player in the most important club competition ever is Cristiano Ronaldo. It's not a conversation. It's not, oh, you know, it might be Sador. What? 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 Uh, <clears throat> I, I have nothing to add. I mean, it's just there, it's a big gap. The clutch goals are there, the moments are there. If it was like, I think 2014, 15, like you could have had a different convo. 2015, yeah, 2016, fine, because Ronaldo wasn't great. I think 2017, like, did a long way to ending it, and then 2018, just what do you do after that? Um, it's just the body of that three peat is too much for sure. Um, you, I just mean before 2017, you could actually go criticize his um, the fact that he was getting injured near the end of both our Champions Leagues. He wasn't really good against Atletico in the final, didn't play against Man City, wasn't good against Atletico in both finals. What am I saying? One final. Um, but then he did that, which was crazy. I'm glad he did that for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, hey, people want to debate it. They're, they're going to want to debate it. <laughs> they can debate it, but... It's because people... There's no arguments against what I said. 
Yes, there isn't. Uh, other than um, like the, it's just changing the goalposts, which is like you know, like sample size or clutch moments are not the whole picture of a player. Or yeah, you have to shift the goalpost to outside the sample of the Champions League for sure. Well, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. Like, like this is what like to me it what matters is how you perform in the biggest stake moments. This is why, like, I can never take James Harden that seriously historically speaking because he just all this regular season stuff goes to shit in the playoffs. Like we don't, I look at the biggest important moments. Ronaldo has it all in the bag, man. And he performed in everything and all the, anything else he wanted to group stage, whatever, but knockout is when he like truly came alive. And that, that's special to me. Um, all right. Did we have any other things that we wanted to touch on? We're an hour and hour and a half in. No, unless there's any other super chat questions or any of the likes. Um, that was the last one. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for the super chats and and for tuning in. If you guys joined in late, it's going to be posted after the fact. So tomorrow, Lucas and I are going to do our LDA Dispuest. That's after every single game for members only. We have reflected thoughts 24 hours after the game. So that's over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid, or you can join on the YouTube memberships tab on this channel. And uh, Tuesday, got a special guest. A little bit outside the box. Uh, I won't spoil it yet because I need to confirm with him tonight. Uh, Tuesday, we got a special guest. So that'll be for free. And then uh, I think the rest of the shows are only for members. So make sure you tune in uh, and become a member. We'd love to have you. Everything is live now, and if you're a member, you get a Zoom link, and you join us on Zoom. All right, Sid, thank you. Listeners, thank you. Enjoy the remainder of the weekend, whatever's left on it, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Peace out.